I don't know about you all, but I am pretty hyped. It is a feel-good Friday. It is gorgeous out. We have playoff basketball. Stephen A's in LA, who is already DJing, getting the vibes going, a little hove, Max Kellerman on the tees. How are we feeling, fellas? We ready to do no, this? No, Stephen A's got to be tired. You don't look tired, but brother, you can't be getting any sleep out there, getting up no. for a 4 o'clock morning, a 4 a.m. meeting. Man, last night was the first night I got some sleep in three days. First night I got some sleep in three days, but I'm ready now. All right, let's do this. When the red always light comes ready. on, he's always ready. Facts, facts on facts. All right, let's go. You know who else is always ready? That would be Russell Westbrook. He delivered a passionate speech in the middle of the season after a loss, telling his teammates that they're going to make the playoffs despite all the injuries, a COVID-19 outbreak, and losing streaks on Thursday night. Westbrook delivered, scoring 18 points, 15 assists, 8 rebounds to spark Washington's 142-115 playing tournament route over Indiana to clinch the eighth seed. So here's the deal. Washington next faces the top-seeded Philadelphia 76ers on Sunday in the first round after completing a relentless run to a playoff berth that hasn't been done in nearly 25 years, y'all. Here's a triple-double king. I just wanted to let the team know that, um, you know, this season – at the time, you know, we were struggling and everybody was doubting us on the outside and uh, we had to figure out a way to, to knuckle up and, uh, you know, make the playoffs. Simple as that. I didn't care what happened in the previous games. Moving forward, we had to figure ourselves out, look ourselves in the mirror. I started with myself and uh, I made it clear to the guys that uh, we will make it. I want to go shopping with Russell Westbrook. Uh, Stephen A., what does this mean for Westbrook's reputation, what he pulled off? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I mean, are you, are, 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 is this a trick question? Are y'all kidding me? No. This is Russell Westbrook that we're talking about here. 22, 11, and 11, he's averaged on the season. Another triple double. The dude, how many times have I had to say it? The most athletic point guard in the history of basketball. A surefire future Hall of Famer, first ballot, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and we're celebrating him making it to the playoffs, I would remind Russell Westbrook and anybody else that wants to support his position that at the time that people were down on them, it would have something to do with the fact that they were the 13th seed in the Eastern Conference and 15 games below 500. That might have something to do with why people had doubts. Okay, I'm just saying. All right? Now, credit to him, to Scott Brooks, to their young squad with some talent on it, and, of course, uh, Bradley Beal for them doing what they did going at 17 and 6 to close out the season and getting themselves in position to make the playoffs and then showing up last night and and, and making a lie out of me because I thought the Indiana Pacers would be a hell of a lot better than that. But Russell Westbrook has destroyed them this season and, and, and more power to him. He did it again last night as far as I'm concerned. Here's the thing. Russell Westbrook. Everybody talks about the Wizards like there's this team that's never been in the playoffs. Prior to the last two seasons when they were ravaged by injury, particularly to John Wall, the Washington Wizards had made the playoffs four times in five years. They had gone to game seven of an Eastern Conference semifinals against Boston. It wasn't like they were off the radar or something like that. Now, Russell Westbrook's arrival definitely has elevated them, and we appreciate that. But when it comes to Russell Westbrook, excuse me, y'all, I've seen this guy in four conference finals. I've seen this guy in the NBA finals. But since Kevin Durant has departed from Oklahoma City, Russell Westbrook has been out of the play, out of the first round in three of the four years. And last year he went to the semifinals. He had COVID and all of that other stuff, playing with James Harden in Houston. And, and, and you know, was a man amongst boys. He, he gave it all he had, but they couldn't beat LeBron and the Lakers. But three of the last four years he's been out in the first round. And this year is going to make four of five years that he going home in the first round because they ain't beat Philly. So y'all go ahead and, and, and celebrate all you want to. Um, I, I want to see Russell Westbrook playing, uh, uh, competing for championships. And we know that the Washington Wizards have no chance of doing that. That's right. They don't. And by the way, they almost didn't have any chance of making the playoffs, Stephen A. The number I saw was in April at some point, it was a 0.6% chance. Mm -hmm. A 1 in 200 shot almost. Mm -hmm. Under 1% chance of making the playoffs. And Russell Westbrook basically told his team, I'm going to get us there. And he did. That helps. Does it erase every bad thing that's ever happened in his career in the playoffs? Of course not. But it's another little piece of evidence. It helps. And by the way, you know how many point guards have ever been the best player? Let's just take the, the you know recent years on a championship team. Almost none. 
You could say Steph Curry, but oh, let me let me amend that. You know how many point guards have been the best player on a championship team where it wasn't due to injury, right? Steph Curry was the best player on his team, didn't win finals MVP, but was the best player on his team when they won the championship because LeBron had two guys hurt, Kyrie and Kevin Love hurt. Who's that? Has James Harden been the best player on a championship team? Has CP3 been the best player on a championship team? Why is Russell Westbrook getting killed? Oh, well, because he had Kevin Durant. He hasn't really even proved that he could be the second best player on a championship team. And that's fair criticism. We got to admit what's fair. But it's also fair to point out that this dude seems to have a will to win that carried his team that looked dead in the water, dead in the water, to the playoffs. Stephen A., let's not forget, he came out uninspired last game, the game before this. And I was even shocked by it, like no intensity from Westbrook. And he was playing a Pacers team that seemed to be playing very good basketball, inspired basketball. They beat a team in Charlotte that had the same energy Westbrook did last time out. That's why you like the Pacers. That's why people are picking the Pacers. But when it was win or go home, Russell Westbrook showed up. And to pretend that that didn't happen, that that doesn't help his reputation, is ridiculous. It occurred. No, of course no, it helped. No, 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 no. It's not about being ridiculous. It's about people like you being shameful. And here's why. Because you're the guy that feeds that kind of mentality where he's allowed to sit around and act like people are hating on him. That is not true. When has Russell Westbrook been hated on over the last four years? When Kevin Durant departed from OKC, we blamed Kevin Durant. How do you go from a game seven in a conference finals to sitting up there saying basically you can't win with this guy? How do you do that? We pointed the finger at Kevin Durant. We pointed the finger at Kevin Durant, leaving him high and dry and leaving him to absorb whatever level of little criticism was thrown in his direction when people were looking at his point guard play. We raved about the triple-double. He was voted a league MVP. We've recognized his greatness. We've talked about him being one of the, the, uh, the most athletic point guard in NBA history and how great he is and then somehow some way because somebody reminds him of that greatness and talks about how we want to see this greatness when it really really matters deep into the playoffs at the very least you got LeBron hugging them on the court and then tweeting about how you know what the, the hate is out there can hate who the hell has been hating on Russell Westbrook nobody has the fact of the matter is we all have appreciated his greatness the fact that he goes 100 miles an hour he never Never cheats you with effort. He steps on the court. He goes after everybody. He makes no friends for the opposite uniform. He goes after them like a par uh, piranha. We all know that about him. So this stuff about people hating on him. No, you're reminding him. Yo, bro, you are here. You're that elite. We want to see you when it really, really matters. We don't want to see you squeezing into the playoffs, fighting oh, for a 10th seed or an 8th seed, and then yeah, you go so. home in the first round. That, There's I, nothing wrong with that. By the way, well, that's mostly fair about Westbrook. That's mostly, mostly fair criticism about Westbrook. In the last three years, he's been on three different teams. And the same thing that's happened happens every year. Happened this year again. New situation, new teammates. And it's like first half of the year, he's falling off. Second half of the year, he figures it out. He's amazing as always. So, like, in that situation, you're getting acclimated. Sometimes it takes you a couple of years. He hasn't had that. That's number one. Number two, we act like Russell Westbrook's never been to a finals before his prime. He wasn't in his prime yet. He was green. You would say wet behind the ears, breath smelling like Similac. And they came up short, was in the finals. Was in a Western Can Conference question, finals man? against one of the greatest teams of all time. Went to a game seven. So, what I'm asking you is... If that's true about Westbrook, it just feels to me that he hears that. I don't hear that criticism of Chris Paul. Chris Paul's been on some great teams, and I don't think Chris Paul really deserves Chris it. Paul is not, yeah. Chris Paul is not 6'4", and considered and, and his biggest – hold on. Hold on. I'm answering your question. He's not 6'4". He's not considered one of the – arguably the most athletic – actually, not even an argument – the most athletic point guard in NBA history. He doesn't walk around averaging a triple-double. He doesn't create mismatches against himself 90% of the night. He steps on the court. That's Russell Westbrook. And when You're holding that Russell, against Westbrook? No. What I'm saying is, is that as a result of that, Max, that's the standard. When we talk about LeBron James all the time – if you look at LeBron James' resume, do you know that theoretically 
We can come on the air every day and literally avoid talk. LeBron has elevated himself to such a stature. Do you realize that we can? To me, it's all about the durability. I don't believe that LeBron James is healthy. Um, he's not even close to 100%. And I think that, unfortunately, that's what he's going to need to be in order to win the chip, to repeat as a champion. He's not winning his fifth championship if he's less than 100%. And he swears that he's never going to be 100% again. Well, damn it, you better be close. All right, I'll throw it at 99. I'll throw it at 98. I'll throw it at 95. You better be up there in the high 90s in order to repeat because it's too much of, it's too much of an arduous road that he and the Lakers are going to have to travel in order for him to pull this out. Everybody ain't the Golden State Warriors. We understand what Steph Curry is. But we also understand that Golden State this particular season has its limitations. That may not be the case with the with the Los Angeles Clippers or the Denver Nuggets or the Portland Trailblazers. Whoever the hell you're going to end up going up against is probably going to be Portland. But the bottom line is that's really what this comes down to. And you certainly going to need all you can do to, if you're going to go up against the Brooklyn Nets or even the Milwaukee Bucks or the Philadelphia 76ers. I don't believe that LeBron James is healthy right now. Hopefully he can get it together. But right now, durability is a huge, huge, huge question mark. And, and that's my concern with him right so now. So wait, so is your concern that he's going to be worse off early because he's hurt? Or as the playoffs go on, it's going to get worn down even more? So he'll as be the better. Go down, as the playoffs go on, he's going to get worn down even that's more. That's possible. I mean, that's possible that that happens. I think if the Clippers were avoiding the Lakers in the first round, that's probably what they were – that's probably entered their minds and factored into their thinking. I think if you saw that playing game against Golden State, though, Clippers made a mistake. Get them early while they're cold. Don't wait for them to get ahead of steam. Because Stephen A., LeBron, to me, it has nothing to do with whether it's early or late in the playoffs. It simply has to do with how much they need him. With the exception of the series in Dallas, the first time he'd been to a finals with a chance to win, because he grabbed, he dragged a, a Cleveland team, what was that, 07, kicking and screaming to the finals. They had no business in the finals. They had no shot. But that Miami team was supposed to win, and because LeBron choked, an all-time choke job, fourth quarter, didn't want the ball, they lost. That's the only time I saw LeBron really choke. Otherwise, he's been, and he was learning. He just got there, whose team is it, him or Dwayne Wade, all that stuff. Since then, he has been one of the great clutch players in any sport you ever want to see. He's come through so many times, it's even hard to remember them. And, and it's, it's not about whether it's early in the playoffs or late. It's about when they need him to do it. And it's also not just about scoring the ball. And it's also not just about offense. LeBron has some of the most memorable defensive plays in the fi not just in the finals, throughout the playoffs. He's had some of the most incredible defensive assignments for a guy where you're like, wait, he's guarding the point guard, and the point guard is the fastest thing on two feet, and LeBron's a four, and he's guarding that dude? He will do whatever his team needs to do to be successful, whether it's early or late. I don't see a difference between early playoffs LeBron and late playoffs LeBron. And Stephen A., I appreciate your point that maybe he gets worn down or maybe if they can finish off some series early, he can get a little rest, heal up, and get ahead of steam going and get the chemistry and the rhythm right with the team and integrate Schroeder and AD properly and be more dangerous as it goes on. I get where you're coming from. I mean, listen, like I said, LeBron James hasn't given us any reason to doubt him, but we haven't seen LeBron in this situation in the playoffs. The closest we've seen LeBron to this situation is when he caught those grant, those cramps against San Antonio in the finals when the AC, as DJ Collett came on the show and said, the AC ain't working. You know what I'm they don't love yeah. you no more. They don't love you no more. They remember DJ Collett came on first take and said that years ago in South Beach, talking about the AC being compromised and all of that other stuff. And LeBron caught those cramps, okay? He wasn't the same. They lost that series. We get all of that. But in the end, what it comes down to is this. I think on a, on a serious note, as it pertains to injury, we've never seen LeBron come into a postseason looking this way. Yeah, he turned it on in the second half, but I was there for that game the other night, Max. That first half, I mean, he was awful. And Anthony Davis was awful, too. And 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 I think their health um, and, and, and the absence of rhythm, because they've been compromised by health and had to miss so many games, has really, really been a challenge for them. And against the Golden State Warriors, you can get away with it. Against the other teams in the playoffs this year, 
I don't think so. So we'll see. That's the real calculus, I think, or the calculation that a team like the Clippers or any team they might see in the playoffs has to make about the Lakers. Do you think that he'll be more hurt later on because they have to play and play and play on these nagging injuries? And does that make it better to get them later? Or does the chemistry offset that? Because they haven't played together a lot recently, that that they'll they'll integrate all the pieces right, get ahead of steam going, get the rhythm going, and that'll offset whatever, you know, kind of drawback injuries have over time. I don't know the answer to that question. If I were a team, I'd rather catch the Lakers early than late. I think once they get into a rhythm, they'll be able to deal with with whatever nagging injuries. But I'd rather catch them cold early than, than deal with them late. Stephen A., tell me this, because I know you are concerned about the health, obviously, and we know the Suns are legit. They're the two seed. How much or what exactly do you need to see from Anthony Davis so they can get the job done here? He's got to be a man amongst boys. I don't want to see Anthony Davis just shooting jump shots. I'm not saying that can't be a part of his repertoire. But Anthony Davis is a formidable presence on the front court with his back to the basket in the post, schooling cats. And defensively, obviously, he's a shot blocker as well. He needs to be a dominant big man. He can't give DeAndre Ayton any life. He can't allow that young man to believe he belongs on a court with Anthony Davis throughout this series. And Chris Paul and those boys have been in DeAndre Ayton's ear and preaching to him about how important he is to the success of this team. They don't have a shot at winning it all if DeAndre Ayton doesn't show up against the big boys in, in the West. Anthony Davis, Jokic, uh, uh, Rudy Gobert, and others. DeAndre Ayton has to have a presence, and they know it. Anthony Davis has to kill that before he gets any kind of momentum whatsoever, or it could give Phoenix even more life than we realize, and they could end up winning this series. No debate there. All right. Game one, Saturday, 3.30. Here for all that. All right, guys, when we come back, a fun fact for y'all. Kyrie Irving will be playing in front of Celtics fans for the very first time since joining. Vamos, Kyrie Irving spent the first six seasons of his career in Cleveland, where he was an all-star four times, won Rookie of the Year, and also won a chip. He then moved on to Beantown, where he would spend the next two seasons. Kyrie was an all-star in both seasons, but the Celtics never made it to the finals during his time there in Boston. And he's now in his second season with the Nets. This season, Kyrie joined Larry Bird, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant as the only players to average 25 points per game in a 50, 40, 90 season. Let's not forget, y'all, uh, that Kyrie's tenure with the Seas didn't exactly end on a high note. Also this, he will play in front of Boston fans for the very first time in the series, obviously due to COVID. Stephen A., tell me this. Uh, what does Kyrie need to prove in the series? That he's focused and not distracted. That's all. Uh, We know what a superstar he is. We know that he's box office, even though, Max, uh, I don't know if you've seen the reports, but um, actually the New York Knicks sold out in 20 minutes for their playoff game. (laughs) Meanwhile, the Brooklyn Nets evidently need James Harden to help sell playoff tickets. I mean, I just want to point that out. The topic would be peace in the Middle East, and Stephen Uh, A. would talk about actually the Knicks. Orange and blue skies, baby. Orange and blue skies. That's all I'm trying to say. But anyway, let me get back to Kyrie. He's got to be focused. There's nothing about his game to talk about here. Playoff basketball, last time we did see him in the playoffs, he averaged 20 against Milwaukee, got taken out in five shots, just 35% from the field and just 21% from three-point range. I don't anticipate that that's going to happen this time around, not when you got Kevin Durant and James Harden as your teammates. We all know that, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, this brother's box office. I think he's probably the greatest show in the NBA, this side of Steph Curry. Kyrie is just that spectacular. And playing with Kevin Durant and with James Harden, we know how lethal they are. We know they should be the favorites to win it all. We know they are the favorites in most people's minds to win it all. So what could potentially get in the way? What could potentially get in the way are distractions, meaning you really don't care about basketball. There's too much going on in the world, and that's where your mind is, and you're really not that interested in playing, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of thing is the only thing that can happen. I don't believe that will happen come postseason time because it is the postseason. And Kyrie understands that he's here for a reason, and he and KD got to win the chip. Got to win the chip. It's a chip or bust. Everybody knows that. So he knows that, and as a result of that, I think that he will show up and what have you. But again, in terms of answering the question as to what he has to prove, he just has to prove that he can stay focused on the issue at hand, which is basketball. 
okay? He needs to be focused on that for the next two months so they can win the chip. Well, I mean, you keep bringing up KD and Kyrie. They got to win the chip. To me, the key there is actually Harden and D'Antoni, but we can talk and debate about that all through the playoffs, I'm sure. What does Kyrie have to prove here? Stephen A., the fact is Kyrie's a baller when he needs to be. The fact is, like, or at least there's a good chance he might lead the team in scoring through these playoffs, even with KD on the team. Like, we don't know. Let's see how this all pans out. But I do think he has some stuff to show here, and that is maybe not primarily to the fans in Boston, but to people who saw him join a Celtics team and sort of destroy the chemistry. And you can say whatever you want. Kyrie joined a team that performed a little bit worse with him on the court than with him off, which is insane. How do you add Kyrie to any team and it doesn't get better? That's insane. Might be the most skillful player who ever lived. Same thing happened in Brooklyn, by the way. You know, until Cade, until uh, uh, Harden showed up. You know, it was KD and Kyrie and Harden out of control. But you know, you know what happened in the last series, Stephen A., who people forget about is Kemba Walker. Kemba Walker is the closest approximation to Kyrie Irving in the NBA. Similar games. He's just like a smaller, not quite as good Kyrie Irving. People forget that because Kemba's been hurt at least the first half of the season. He wasn't Kemba Walker. But I saw Kemba Walker again very recently, and he outplayed Russell Westbrook. And he's the guy where people are like, yeah, he can kind of do what Kyrie does, but instead of being a, a, a guy who might erode your chemistry, he's a guy who's going to, you know, build up the chemistry. He's a good locker room guy. He's going to be a leader, right? And Kyrie, if he has anything to prove in this series, to me, it's no, 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 no. Kemba Walker's one level, I'm another. That's a, not, Kemba does not replace me. For example, Kemba can't outplay him. You mentioned Kyrie being a distraction. Right, that can't happen. He, especially against the Celtics, especially with fans in Boston, Kyrie can't show up and be any kind of problem or show that, yeah, the guy who replaced me, the version of me who's not quite as good but in important ways better, that can't happen. He's got to be better than Kemba. If he's got anything to prove, maybe that's it. Okay, uh, let's bring in a guy who played for the Nets and who calls their game. My guy, Richard Jefferson. It's been a minute. Good to see you. So I'm going to ask you the same question. What does Kyrie Irving need to prove? Stephen A. said he can't be a distraction. Max says he's got to be better than Kemba Walker. He's got absolutely nothing to prove, right? Now, understand this. Kyrie's role with this Brooklyn Nets team is very similar to his role with the Cleveland Cavs. You have the ultimate playmaker. Once it was LeBron James. Now you have James Harden. When James Harden came over, there was so much conversation about it. Well, is who's going to be the point guard? Is there not? Kyrie was like, hey, this is your ball. You are the point guard. I'm going to be the score. That's what he was with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Like the second year we went to the NBA Finals, their third time going to the Finals, he led the team in shot attempts. That's where he feels most comfortable. But he also wanted to prove that he could run a team, that he could be a point guard. And that's what the Boston situation was. I think after experiencing that in Boston, he decided, one, he wanted to pair up with, you know, he brought in, he picked his team. It was Kevin Durant. It was DeAndre Jordan. They picked their location. This is where they wanted to build something. So then what does he do? They are the next, excuse me, they bring in James Harden. So then he was like, look, I feel most comfortable. I've had the most success as an individual player when I just go out there and score. And I don't worry about getting other people involved. I go and be aggressive. Now, listen, don't start shaking your head. He goes and gives you a 50, 40, 90. Now, when we talk about what Kyrie has to prove, he's already won a championship. He's already been a part of playoff runs. There is nothing that he's going to accomplish in this role that he hadn't accomplished already in Cleveland. What, is he going to hit a game-winning shot? The only thing that Kyrie has to do is win a championship because you picked your team, you brought them together at your location. The only thing that you have to do is win a championship, and you've well, already done that. Well, first of all, you're pretty slick because I was getting ready to jump all over you and say you're too brilliant of a basketball mind. You've accomplished too much in this game. You've been connected to this game for far too long, and you're far too knowledgeable to make that insane, to, to give that insane take you just gave. But you covered yourself because you closed out with the point. That's exactly what I was going to make. Don't, ba don't all, bury hold, the lead. Hold, hold listen. They're all in Brooklyn 
because of Kyrie Irving. Not Madison Square Garden. They're in Brooklyn because that's where Kyrie wanted to be. A lot of people don't realize this. KD went to Brooklyn because that's where Kyrie wanted to go. You understand what I'm saying? Kyrie essentially followed Kyrie to Brooklyn, even though KD's the man, and he's the reason why Brooklyn would do everything. Because Brooklyn didn't necessarily care to have Kyrie. It's that KD wanted to come to Brooklyn, but he wasn't going to do it without Kyrie, and Kyrie wanted to go there. That's really the story. But that's a different story for another day. At the end of the day, let's pay attention. They were already a champion, meaning Kyrie Irving, with LeBron in Cleveland when Kyrie wanted to leave because he wanted he wanted it for himself. He didn't want to be the little brother, or as I quoted somebody in Kyrie's camp and saying, he didn't want to be sunned by, 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 by LeBron. He wasn't trying to be LeBron's son or whatever. He's trying to be his old man. Then he goes to Boston, and Max pointed out how they looked worse with him then better. Injured the first year prior to the postseason. Second year gets on the court, gets taken out in five games, even though the year before they had gone to the Eastern Conference Finals. Game seven of an Eastern Conference Finals. And then ultimately he comes there. They get taken out in five by Milwaukee. He shoots 21% from three-point range, 35% from the field, which is not Kyrie Irving. So then you come to Brooklyn. Last year you only played 20 games because KD's out. People are looking for you to be the showstopper, but you end up getting injured again. And now here we go. You in Brooklyn this year. You got Harden. You got KD. Don't tell me there's nothing to prove in terms of, yeah, not as an individual player, nothing on the court per se in terms of his performance. But what you can't be is any kind of distraction that people can look at and say, if they don't win the chip, that's part of the reason why. That cannot happen with him. If that happens with him, it's a disaster. It's a disaster. That, Richard. Well, no. Oh, well, no, my only thing is this. You said, what does he have to prove, right? He doesn't have, I don't think he necessarily has to, to stay prove focused. that. It, no, no, but yeah, 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 stay fickle. But what does he have to prove? In my opinion, on the court, and this is where we all agree, individually his talent. My only thing is this. He's already proven what he can do in the postseason. He's already proven the numbers that he can do. The one thing that Kyrie has to prove is that he can bring a team together like he did, and win a championship. Has That's he the proven that he could be a distraction? Well, the, well, one of the problems, one of the problems that he's facing is the Brooklyn Nets have such overwhelming firepower. They're supposed Doesn't, to might not win. matter. So, so mm -hmm. that's why, if it doesn't, if he has nothing to prove, that's why. But to Stephen A's point, Richard, there is downside. It's almost like there's no upside, but there is downside. Don't be a problem. Don't be a reason the team implodes. Don't like. Don't let Kemba Walker, even if they if the Celtics lose, but they give a spirited effort. They play together. Kemba plays just as well as Kyrie. Yeah. Stuff like that. The, the, there's limited upside because it's the first round. You're overwhelming favorites. And and Richard, I agree with you. To me, the secret sauce in Brooklyn is is like quiet is kept. It's James Harden and Mike D'Antoni running what they run, mm -hmm. except now their weapons are KD, Kyrie, and Joe Harris. Good <laughs> luck. Good not, freaking not, not, luck. Talk about Max. Talk about Max. You know why, Richard, you know why I always dismiss Max when he says that? Stay with me, Max, because I'm very serious about this. I'm not saying that you're wrong about Dan Tony with Harden, but what if another coach had a different system, but I still had KD, Kyrie, and James Harden. Wouldn't that work, too? If Scott Brooks was coaching those three, Maybe instead not of like Russell West, if, if Scott Brooks was coaching those three, instead of Westbrook and Bradley Beal and some young talent in, in the nation's capital, would, would, would there be a difference? If Tom Thibodeau was coaching this team instead of the Knicks, would there be a difference? I mean, when, if Greg Popovich had them instead of what he has in San Antonio right now, would there be – stop acting like Mike D'Antoni would hold no, no. in. No, but what I'm saying it's is – hard in KD and Kyrie. Wait, wait, Richard, let me be – let me, let me, I understand your point, Stephen A. Let me be very clear about what I'm saying, why I like them, even though they've been – hurt they've only played eight games together and everything else I look at the Golden State Warriors with KD the team that LeBron basically raised the white flag before the series started who can ever beat them went to a seventh game against Houston that Houston didn't even have Chris Paul missed every three they took basically and still only lost by single digits my point is this Dan Tony's system run by Harden takes a far inferior team and almost beats the best team ever now it's D'Antoni's system run by Harden, but with the Warriors' talent. Forget it. It's over. And it doesn't have to do primarily with KD or Kyrie.
All right, here's what I know. Vegas also thinks it's over because they have them winning the finals. RJ's going to be back with us. The Nets are favored by 7.5. And, and first take just getting started on this Friday. So coming up next, a quote from Hawks. Prediction time. Quick takes. Let's go. Stephen A. Heat Bucks. Who will remain standing? We got Stephen A. here. Well, I'm right here. Okay, okay, there you go. I didn't hear, any, I didn't hear anything. Heat Bucks. Who's going to win, Stephen A.? Bucks in seven. All right, let's keep it going. Max, Blazers, Nuggets, which team advances? This is a tough one. I'm going to take the Nuggets, and I'm going to say that Jokic is unstoppable, they, and, and they're, they're going to double them, and that means even without Jamal Murray, Porter's going to do his thing. I like the Nuggets in seven. Okay, Stephen A., Hawks, Knicks, are you confident in your squad to get out of the first round? Hell yeah. Now, I think it's going to be tough because the Hawks are young, talented team, but the operative word is young, and they're going up against a top defense in the NBA. I think it's going to be a little bit too much for them in seven games. Knicks in seven. They close it out at Madison Square Garden. They're young, but they're ready. Let's stay with that series. Atlanta Hawks interim coach Nate McMillan fined 25000 for saying the NBA wants the New York Knicks in the playoffs. Here's the quote. Absolutely. I've talked about that to the team a lot. Basically, I've gone as far as saying the league wants this. They need this. New York, this is a big market for the league, and New York has been out of the playoffs for a number of years. And this is a team that our league, they want to see. There's a huge fan base, and they want to see New York in the playoffs. Earlier today on KJZ, Commissioner Adam Silver had this to say. Nate's a veteran coach. I mean, he knows better. I mean, he he's trying to inspire his team to suggest that the league somehow would prefer some teams over others, and it's just not the case. And he knows it, and he's got a young team, and he just wants to get them going. Max Kell. Yeah. Nate McMillan's comments, fair or foul? Totally fair. And let me say, I'm not questioning Adam Silver's ethics. And I think Adam Silver is a terrific commissioner, and I love the way – what are you rolling your eyes for? Already. I'm not going to even tell one you. Sentence I'll school you one day. And, I'm not going to even tell you why I'm rolling my eyes, school, but go ahead. Hey, you school me. And I That's think right. he answered that perfectly. Like, yeah, the coach is trying to, you know, don't get on him. But let me say this. Not only is it totally fair for Nate McMillan to say it, he knows as soon as he opens his mouth it's going to cost him money. He knows as he, here comes 25 Gs and he's willing to spend it. And why is he willing to spend it? Well, look, let's first look at what he said. He told no lies. And it doesn't even have to be a conscious thing. Look. Businesses are incentivized by profit. Your incentive is to optimize your profits, right? And so if you alienate a fan base of 20 million, New York is the largest fan base or the largest market in the country by 100%. It's twice the size of LA, which is twice the size of the next market. 20 million fans, 20 million people. And, and have they been as engaged in the NBA as they should have been over the last 20 years because the pathetic state of the Knicks? No. You know if the Knicks advance, the whole league is going to be enhanced by that? Of course. So you know it makes you money. With that, your incentive, you're incentivized to want the Knicks to do, to do well. That doesn't mean you're telling the refs, call it for the Knicks, anything like that. But the incentive exists, and incentives shape behavior. Okay, so since you know that, you're Nate McMillan, you say it out loud. Now, what does that do? What does that do? It exerts a little pressure. It boxes the refs a little bit. Don't let it be some crazy disparity in free throws, right? Oh, the Knicks are getting one free throw for every three their opponent gets. Don't let, it, don't let something happen like that. In a close call, is it human nature to think, let me call it for the... Yeah, it is. He is doing whatever he can to exert public pressure. Phil Jackson used to do the same thing to the Knicks, Stephen A. He, well, basketball's a beautiful flowing game. It's not about, you know, it's not so physical and stuff because he didn't want the other team to be more physical. Nate McMillan is giving his team the best chance, and he's spending 25 Gs to do it. It's fair. That's why it's foul. Because that's the kind of edge you're looking for. What's the matter? You scared? You scared Julius Randle? You scared of Julius Randle, Nate McMillan? You scared of him? You scared? Well, I, you, I mean, you, you just scared of R.J. Barrett? What, you scared of Nate, Nate McMillan? That's, that's what it is? I thought you had Trey Young. 
I thought you had Collins. I thought you had DeAndre Hunter. I thought you had Clint Capella. I thought you had a crew, Nate McMillan. I mean, you 27 and 11 as a coach since you took over after Lloyd Pierce was let go. I mean, you've proven once again you're a hell of a coach. All right? You got, you're a hell of a coach. All right? You got young players. You got one of the great shooters, one of the great young stars in this game in Trey Young. What's the problem? Why you need that kind of edge? I mean, what's up? And that's what it is? You, you scared? You scared? You scared of Julius Randle? You scared of quickly? You scared of Derrick Rose? The remer- the reemergent <laughs> Derrick Rose? You scared of RJ Barrett? I mean, what's up? Why why you need to do something like that? What you need to do something like that for? How you gonna come into the series before one single game was played in the postseason already complaining about the officials, already complaining about the league? What's up, Nate McMillan? What's going on? That's my brother. I love him. You know, I appreciate the job that he's done. Very, very happy for him. By the way, Mark Spears showed up on the jump the other day, and I'm glad he reminded us all. Nate McMillan, Atlanta Hawks, would you please give this man a contract extension? Would you be, please make him the permanent head coach for the Atlanta Hawks? How the, hell, a bit. how the hell is he looking for, uh, you know, looking for a new contract? You know, this is his only season. Give the man a damn contract. Having to, Now, back to this. Adam Silver is absolutely right. The Milwaukee Bucks are relevant. Small market teams, in the NBA's eyes, the small market teams, the more successful you are, the better it is. Want to hear no stuff about New York. If the New York Knicks, if it really was in the league's best interest for the New York Knicks to be relevant, Zion would be in New York because the ping pong ball would have went to them instead of the New Orleans Pelicans. So don't get me started with that. I'm just saying it's foul because you're looking for an edge. And what you're looking for an edge for, Nate McMillan, you scared? You scared? Scared of Julius Randle? You scared of R.J. Barrett? You scared of Derrick Rose? They, 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 he sound a little scared to me. You know something. That's what he does. He you know sound something. a little scared. You know something? Let me take a page out of your book. That's nauseating. This is a Knicks fan. Molly, I want you to take a good look at a Knicks fan. Makes everything about the Knicks, no matter what we're talking about. And he tries to turn this whole thing into anyone scared of the Knicks. Let me ask you something. When Phil Jackson used to do exactly what Nate McMill- McMillan is doing right now, and he had Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. Was Not he true. scared of the Knicks? <clears throat> Not was true. He scared? Not true. He used Phil to work with, the rest publicly. Phil, Phil did it. Phil did it in the throes of a series trying to switch momentum and things of that nature after games were played. He didn't do it before the damn series started. What, not a what? game has been played yet. Right? Even better to do Nothing it now. Nothing has been played even, yet. You, it's look, not even Nate better. McMillan is it's shining a spotlight on a certain scared. issue. He's not scared. And now, see, he's not scared. See, no, That's a, Julius so Randle. Julius Randle. Scared. Scared. Julius Randle got him scared. And now here comes Julius, Julius, right right Derrick Rose got him scared. That's what, that's what I said. That's what I said. That's all I'm saying. Nate McMillan is shining a spotlight on something. And if it turns out the Knicks are getting, say, a lot more calls or a controversial call goes oh, their way, Nate McMillan yeah. after a game can come out there down 2-1. Well, it's a close Don't series. Worry, it's like right? a 50-50 series. So Nate worry, McMillan right? is giving every edge to his team. So he oh. can come out at a press conference and spend another 25 Gs and this say, did it, this is what I was talking right. about. When, they made 20 more trips to the free the throw Knicks. line than we did. Since when did a team need an edge against the Knicks? They're supposed to be the little old Knicks. Knicks to the four huh? seed. Atlanta's that's, that's, the five that's seed. Right. That's orange and blue skies, baby. Times have changed. That's what I'm trying to I'm say. Not to this that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not talking to you no more. Orange and blue skies, not, you, baby. You, yeah, and that's not. what I'm trying to say. Orange this and blue New skies. New York stand up. Dead. New York stand Listen, up. Steve, yeah, yeah, your yeah. Knicks had the second longest odds to be in the playoffs, yet they are here. So hey, Molly. The microcosm of the city in New York. We're just it, coming back. It ain't just the garden, Molly. The fans taking off. They taking over Phillips Arena. We, go, we coming down to the ATL. Because we travel, yo. You this have no gonna problem be. doing that. This how it's going to be. New York, right. stand up. The, the team in New York, New York you want to know the team up. in New York is right yeah. there. Plays right no, up yeah. no, no, in Brooklyn. No, no. I, I can't Brooklyn. ride with that. Sorry, man. I can't that see Brooklyn. I can't ride with that. In Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Well, you'll be riding with them by the, by, by the conference sure, finals. Oh, sure. Don't worry about sure. it. You'll have no sure. choice. Once the Knicks lose, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. But they won't yeah. lose to Atlanta. Mm, All right, we shall see. Gracing your screens. Monica, what's going on, girl? How are we doing? Um. Good morning, Molly. Just doing a little bit of laundry here as I get Oh, yeah. You know, after oh, yeah. That's a beautiful uniform. Segment. Just, you know. Yeah. yeah you uh-huh. can use dryer sheets. That, that's what I'm talking about, girl. That's They're what I'm talking about, girl. They might make it to the second round. New York, stand I up. I once liked them, Molly. New York, stand up. Kellerman. Kellerman, just relax. 
Let's right. relax. I'm 47 <laughs> right. years old. I've been waiting right. to see them win a championship in my life. You don't care what you want. 47. You don't count in New York no more. You shouldn't even Orient. be allowed residency in the state of New York. Don't You're a traitor. Lakers, You're though. a traitor. We don't want to hear nothing Monica? from you oh. about relax. the Knicks. You're a traitor. Just go. Just go. Right. Okay? In the Knicks. You're right about New that. York. New York in the building. You, New York. Root for a team where yeah, the owner yeah, has yeah. Charles Sold Oakley out Madison Square Garden. Guys, guys, Sold guys. Out. I got like 10 minutes to hang out with y'all. Hold on. Let me get my points off. Come on, Monica. You set this Thank off. You, Monica. Monica. Monica, don't turn Thank around like you're all innocent. She's just you doing set it laundry. Off. She's working from home. It's a pandemic. She's multitasking. That's what great <laughs> women do. All right, Stephen A., who do the Lakers need to worry about uh, more, CP3 or Booker? CP3. Because of his floor generalship and leadership. Devin Book is a scorer machine. He's a young star. Love him. Uh, but we understand that the difference with this year's team is CP3, the leadership and tutelage that he's helped Monty Williams and the staff provide to the rest of the young players out there. Him and, and, and Jay Crowder, I can't say enough about, you know, the pickup of him and how much he's helped them as well. That experience is what we're going to be looking for. Because the reason I got the Lakers winning this series, albeit in seven games, is because I expect LeBron and and his experience to ultimately come shining through. But if there's anybody that can galvanize the troops and peel everything out of them, it's somebody like CP3. Wherever he goes, the team gets better. When he departs, they get worse. It's that simple. And that's the case with the Phoenix Suns right now. So I would say CP3. Yeah, though he's never been to a conference finals. Look, um, I agree CP3 has those intangibles you're talking about. Nothing you can do about that. What are you going to do about his leadership? What are you going to do about his decision-making? You can't even counteract that. The thing to worry about is Devin Booker because Devin Booker, as I see it, has a game that he reminds me of a little mini Kobe. Like, he can score from anywhere, almost no matter what you do. And when the lights shine brightest, it seems to me he plays better. In the bubble last year, he was killing the game. This man scored 70 points, 70, in an NBA game when he's 20 years old. And the whole thing about, is he an empty calorie stats dude on a bad team? No. In the bubble, they were 8-0, no, and he was scoring more than 30 points a game. No, he's a, he's a big stat dude on a team that doesn't lose. I mean, over the span of the last, plus the bubble this season, bubble plus this season, they have the best record. And Devin Booker is their best scorer. What do the Lakers do about that? You going to put KCP on him? You're going to bring Wes Matthews off the bench and try and stop him? What are you going to do about Booker? You may have to put LeBron James at some points, bad ankle and all on him because LeBron we've seen shut down guys like Derrick Rose at times in the finals or in the playoffs back then like the, Booker is a real problem for the Lakers right now obviously guys both of these gentlemen are key pieces for what Phoenix is trying to do but I'm taking this one to Chris Paul in this conversation yes Devin Booker is a prolific scorer but the Lakers also have prolific scores. And a matchup that's really interesting to me in this one is Dennis Schroeder and CP3. We know that CP3 is the general. He is the difference in this team's performance this year compared to last year. But those are two guys that know each other. We know that Chris Paul is all about gangsmanship, talking to the refs, talking a little trash, maybe a little chicken wing here or there. So I think his ability maybe to unsettle someone that he knows so well in Dennis Schroeder could be something that we need to keep an eye on in this particular ball game. But it's definitely CP3 as the floor general distributing for these guys, as well as playing that pick and roll with DeAndre Ayton. So I'm taking CP3 on this one, although Devin Booker is 100% going to be important. Let's also understand one thing that's very important, Max and Monica, is this. The acquisition of Andre Drummond is significant because when you have an additional big body to put in a low post and you're not asking Anthony Davis to man up, per se, literally man on man, and he can play that role of a spy essentially on the front line, patrolling the front line from a shot-blocking perspective, that limits what you can do on the interior. Now, we look at DeAndre Ayton, and obviously he's shooting about you know 56% from the field or something like that so you know he's averaging about 14 a game the bottom line is you're going to expect something from him a little something he's going to have to do something but if you're looking at everybody else particularly the guard play they're going to have to score if the Lakers get back on defense which obviously we expect them to do you're going to have to be able to score 
from the perimeter primarily because you're not going to be able to do but so much on the interior. And that's what we have to take into account. The length of the LeBrons, the length of even an Anthony Davis who can get out on perimeter shooters, the length of even a Kyle Kuzma who's a legit 6'8". When you've got that kind of size, it turns you into a perimeter team primarily. And can Phoenix beat this Lakers team playing that way? That's a question mark. Yeah, there's no debate there. But I want to pick up on what you said, DeAndre Ayton, right? Like, I like Phoenix a lot in the preseason because I said 8-0 in the bubble, you add Chris Paul. This is not like, hey, how are Westbrook and Beal going to play together? Maybe great, but I need to see that. Or, or even Harden and Kyrie. This was on paper, damn Chris Paul and Devin Booker, it sounds good to me, and it has been. But another reason you really like Chris Paul on this team preseason is the only question mark for me on that team heading into the year was, ironically, their number one overall pick, center, right, who's already pretty good. But they're, they're three and D forwards. You, they don't need the ball to be effective. They can shoot. They can defend. Cam Johnson, Mikael Bridges, you know what that's going to be. Chris Paul and Devin Booker, you know you have a good idea what that's going to be. Chris Paul's effect on DeAndre Ayton. That's what you want to see, and it's been a good one. But I think DeAndre Ayton Definitely. is still a little too green. If this was two years from now, then maybe I would agree with you guys about Chris Paul. But I think DeAndre Ayton is still a little green for this matchup with the Lakers. And so even Chris Paul's effect on him, I don't uh, think is going to decide the series. By the way, I said I was mistaken. Well, I, I said 56% from the field. is 62% from the field that DeAndre Ayton is shooting this year. But go ahead, Monica. D definitely, definitely a fantastic leap by Aiton. He here's my thing, though, though, Max. If the Lakers run the pressure that we're suggesting at Devin Booker, right? We're seeing multiple guys hounding him. Maybe we see some double teams. It's going to be imperative to make plays, right? And I still give that playmaking edge, obviously, to CP3. Like, Book is going to have to find the open guy, and he's not going to be able to go full out Kobe throughout the course of a series. May he have some Kobe moments, but he can't be launching that thing over two, two guys uh, consistently throughout the course of a series. Also, I do think that if the Suns are going to make a move, it's going to be in the earlier games. While the Lakers got the win over the Warriors, and I know you guys debated whether or not LeBron's shot was luck, there were also some moments in that game where you could see there was still some rust from this team lacking some continuity, some passes that were just a little bit ahead or a little bit behind and just a little bit off. So if the Suns are going to strike, they're going to have to strike early in this series. And all, yeah. you, gotta, you also got to remember that LeBron, like last year, they lost game one to Portland. And then they came back and won four straight. It's, it's you know, they figure things, LeBron figures things Definitely. out. So, you know, those earlier games are more pivotal for the Suns than it is for the Lakers. Because with LeBron, he usually figures something out. But if he gets ahead of you, I mean, there's no turning back. That's really what this comes down to. So if they want to get any kind of advantage, they're going to have to take advantage early. Uh, uh, by the way, Monica, if you're saying they're going to have to send two guys at Devin Booker, then that answers the question about who they're most worried about. No, she said CB3. Fair. No, 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 because you got to play basketball, Max. Like, once they run two, he can't keep launching over two, period. He's going to have to swing the ball. So yeah. to me, if you don't run, mm, wow, this is my second time on First Cake with Max. Did he just trip me up a little bit? No, I'm <laughs> yeah. still going with CP3 is the most important. Throw that See? to any. Just hold up the jersey. Just distract everybody. Let me see that jersey one more oh, time. Oh, I got you. Beauty. There we go. I got it. There got we go. Let's, let's just focus too. on yeah, that. Yeah. Your I Knicks are in the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. Second longest yeah. odds. They made yeah, it, yeah. Monica. Here we go. All right. Monica, appreciate you. We will uh -huh. talk to you soon. Good stuff as always. Second That's time right. on Orange First Take, you're it. You'll be back again. Orange right. and blue sky. <laughs> Have a fabulous weekend. Enjoy these yeah. games. Oh, Lord. Grizzlies tonight where the winner will take the eighth seed in the Western Conference. Uh, Steph Curry's been on a tear this season and is officially an MVP finalist, but he even can't do this alone. Um, even he can't do this alone. Rather, Stephen A., who needs to step up and help Steph tonight? I'm going to say it's Andrew Wiggins, and I'm going to base that, Max, purely off of what I saw the other night against the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, we all know that I've been on the record stating that I wouldn't give him away for a box of cookies. That's how I felt about Andrew Wiggins because, to me, it wasn't about his talent. He could always play. It was the want-it factor that was so glaringly missing time and time again. He'd have a big game, and then he'd disappear for five or ten games. You know, or he had some of the most, what I consider some of the most meaningless 18-point for games that I've ever seen in my life. I mean, you know, he'd, he'd finish a game with 18 to 20 points, and you barely noticed it for crying out loud because it never really came when it really, really mattered. That was not the case the other night. The other night I watched this guy show up on the court 
and defend LeBron James a lot and was all in him. And I give him a lot of credit for that. Plus, he put up 21 points. Plus, he shot decently enough from the field. And I look at him, his size, his athleticism, he could do some things. Andrew Wiggins, if he really, really committed himself, if he really committed himself, I think he can average 25 a game and be a secondary offensive option. I'm saying for the purposes of tonight, that's exactly what he needs to do for one more night. He needs to go out there and put up 20 plus. He needs to help defend, whether it's John Moran or, you know, or, or Dylan or anybody else. I think that's what he needs to do. Um, and I, and I think I, I'm going to give him a shot at doing it. I, I, I believe he is going to do it, and he is going to help Golden State win tonight's game because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be real tough to beat Memphis. Um, the answer is Draymond Green. I know why you say Wiggins, because when we say help Steph, what are we really talking about? Like, our minds immediately go to offense. And, but even as you pointed out, Draymond's going to have to score. He's even, even there. He's going to have to contribute there in some kind of way. But defensively, he was so good uh, in, the, in the first play. And Stephen A., just like the Lakers' size that you uh, referred to in our last segment, was obvious, right? The Lakers' size kept them in the game when they weren't executing on offense, and Golden State was. And what counteracted the Lakers' size, I think more than anything, on the Golden State defensive side of things was Draymond Green. He is like, you know, I keep saying, like, Ben Simmons is the best defensive player in the world, and I believe that. And then I think about Gobert and, and Embiid, and, and too often I leave Draymond off that because he's not so young anymore, but he is definitely deserving of that kind of consideration. And he's going to have to do that because Stephen A., in the play-in game, Grizzly Spurs, who is the most important offensive piece on the Grizzlies? John Murray. What's that? What are you talking about? Who's the most no, important no. offensive piece? No, John Morant was not the most important offensive piece on the Grizzlies. The center was the most important. Oh, well, Valentinus, offensive. he had 23 and 23. Valentinus I, I, I get that. was a load down low. Right. And Draymond is going to have to do a job on him or they're not going to win. Like, Draymond's defense is going to be key in this game. And when I think of overall team-wise, who needs to be Steph's main support, it's Draymond's defense. And as you pointed out yesterday, he got to chip in a little bit offensively, too. It can't well, be no points. Well, listen, Kevin Looney and others, they got to do something to help him. Valanciunas is a big, big boy. That's a lot to ask of Draymond Green. I mean, uh, when, I th when I think about Valanciunas, other than the fact that he looks like uh, he, he and Travis Kelsey damn near look like twins, for crying out loud. Other than that, when I look at Valanciunas, the one thing I think about is Tyson Fury. Just a big tub of lard just <laughs> leaning on you, and he can play and move and all of that stuff. I'm not saying it insultingly. I I'm very complimentary of Valanciunas. I like he's him just a lot, a load. But, but, he's a, but he's a load. But I will tell you this. Here's the one thing I do want to say about Draymond Green, because I love the brother. You cannot go scoreless. And I've said this before. You cannot go scoreless like he did the other night. And this is the thing. As we watch him with this, with this three-point shooting, Max, because they leave him open now. Over the last several years, three years and counting, he's at 28, 27.9, and this year at 27%. He's teammates with two of the greatest shooters that has ever played this game. Yeah. And even and, and I'm going like this. Look, man, you you know, you you got everything else. You defend, you're smart as a whip, his basketball IQ is off the charts. He's an elite defender. He's a great point forward, a great assist provider. His chemistry with Steph Curry is spectacular to see. All of those things are true. But you got to stay. I mean, Steph Curry and Klay Thompson, they got to get Dre on the court and help him make some of those threes, man. They got to work with him. Because let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Next year, they're going to the conference finals. And God help the basketball world. I don't give a damn if you got Kyrie, KD, and James Harden. God help the basketball world if Draymond Green gets a jump shot. Right. Well, hey, here's the thing. If he gets any kind of jump shot it's so, with Klay and Steph. Oh, what oh, ma what oh, masked, what masked about. Draymond's decline as a shooter was Kevin Durant's presence because he didn't really need it anymore. But people forget, you're right, the original five-out death squad was Draymond at the five who was shooting and hitting threes at a real good clip. I think it was at like 38% that year because of the spacing Steph and Clay gave. 2015, 2016, 38.8%.
38, and then maybe it was 33, but it was still respectable. That's what made it the death lineup. That's why you could play legit five out, right? And then Dre can also make decisions with the ball and get you into the offense, and Steph can play off all those things. Mm -hmm. That has not been the same Draymond Green from the outside, and as a result, Kevin Durant masked that because when Durant's on the floor, it doesn't really matter. But now it matters more. He, I, about this, we're on the same page. He can't wind up with zero points. He's going to have to be Steph's main support, certainly on defense, and is going to have to contribute something offensively. 10 to 12 points. 10 to 12 points. Draymond Green, that's what he should be averaging. He should be averaging 10 to 12 points a game. Yeah, there's no, there's no debate there. I mean, you know, whether it's 8 or 10 or 12, he's got to do something. He can't be scoreless. Right. They're not going to win. So we need to see Wiggins and Draymond step up. Guys, we'll leave it there. When we come back, they say CP3 cannot win a ring. They laugh at Paul George's playoff P nickname. They say Harden isn't clutch. Our fellas pick the player that's going to prove everyone wrong these playoffs. And the Bucks with the biggest. Milwaukee Bucks have the best record again in the NBA, the best defense. Best offense, sailing along with 56 wins. And just were never right in the restart. This season will end in the bubble in Orlando on September 8th. When speaking with the media on Thursday, Buck star Giannis Antetokounmpo was asked if this year will be different than last year regarding the playoffs. And his answer? Just listen. I don't know if this year is going to be different, team. I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't say that. Uh, it might be the same. Who knows? It might. We'll see. The results are going uh, to talk, talk for themselves at the end. Uh, but at the end of the day, is that don't get too high, don't get too low. I feel like last year, probably because of the bubble, you know, wasn't able to get away from basketball, like losing a game and just going to the hotel and seeing the players that just beat you, you, like, got too low. Okay. So there's that. RJ's back with us. Reminder, the Miami Heat beat the reigning back-to-back -back MVP and his Bucks in five games in the Eastern Conference semifinals last summer. Max, uh, yep. do you have a problem with Giannis' comments? Ready for this? Yeah. I don't. I don't have a problem with Giannis' comments. That's right, Richard. I don't have a problem with his comments. What you want him to do? Beat his chest and tell you and guarantee victory? Yeah. That, that make you feel better if you see some false bravado? Oh, yeah, I guarantee you're going to win. We're going to win. How's he going to do that? By the way, people, like, let's not forget the Heat were the only team to take two games from the Lakers last year. It's not just like they beat Milwaukee. They, they took two games from the Lakers last year. Only one to do it, including the entire Western Conference. No, he's not being I, – what I see from Giannis is not someone who's insecure or scared or lacks leadership or anything, maybe by, as defined by many who always want to see someone talk like MJ or Kobe or Larry Bird or someone, right? No, I don't, I, I, don't see, I don't see an insecure player or a young, immature player. I see a mature player. I see uh, uh, someone who's being honest. I don't see him scared. It doesn't look like to me like he's scared or he thinks they can't do it. But he ain't going to guarantee you victory. How can he? Especially what's happened in the playoffs the last couple of years. I see someone who's more focused. To me, I read that as more focused on process. You can't guarantee result, but you can focus on the process. No, not everybody has to be built the same way. Not everyone has to give, you know, we in the media, us in the media, the, the sound bite we're looking here. Wait a minute. Does that sound like Kobe Bryant? No, not everyone has to do that. And I hear a dude who's being real, who, by the way, has real chances, and I would favor against the Heat. And if you ask Giannis, who do you think is going to win? I'm sure he would say, I think it's us. I hope it's us. But he's not going to beat his chest to do what we want to see him do. I got no problem with it. Well, first of all, um, <clears throat> I would appreciate it if you would stop reminding us that last year's NBA Finals was between L.A. and Miami. Uh, in my career, I have always dreamed of that matchup for obvious reasons. Um, and the fact that, that they played against each other during the pandemic uh, when people were not in attendance and it had to be in a bubble in Orlando, Florida, instead of La La and South Beach is still something that hurts me to my core. Having said all of that, I definitely do have a problem with Giannis's comments. And here's the reason why. You're Giannis. You're the reigning two-time league MVP who came up short not once or twice in the last two seasons from getting out of the Eastern Conference. 
You had a 2-0 lead in the conference finals against Kawhi and the Toronto Raptors and got blitzed four straight. Last year, bubble play or no bubble play, you didn't just lose. You lost in five. You got taken out mm. in five mm. games. I'm sorry, mm. that matters. And when that is the backdrop, when that is the last time we've seen you in the postseason, and then you mm. turn around and you're talking about, well, you know, I, you know, you, I don't know if we're going to win it. Oh, hell no. You got your $245 million contract extension, well-deserved, by the way, from Milwaukee in the offseason. They go out and they get you Drew Holiday. If one of the mm. executives knew how to keep their mouth shut, they would have had Bogdanovich as well. You acquired mm. P.J. Tucker. You still mm. kept, step, kept Chris Middleton. Mm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know, mm. we look at, I know we looking at Brooklyn. But in, in all honesty, mm. Brooklyn is the only excuse mm. Giannis should have for not winning a chip. That could be the only thing we should be able to point to because LeBron and AD ain't 100%. The only thing we should be able to point to is Brooklyn as a reason you didn't win at all. So I don't want to hear about, oh, we might lose to Miami in the first round. Damn it, you better not. You better not. God, Stephen, just my, just preaching the gospel out here. My God, I couldn't have said it better myself. Giannis is coming off one of the best three-year runs we've ever seen in NBA history. You're talking about best record in the league, best record in the conference, one of three players to win the MVP and defensive player of the year, one of the few players in league history to win back-to-back -back MVPs. Hey, maybe we give you a pass on the bubble. Maybe we give you a pass because you guys were just starting to develop two years ago when you had the 2-0 lead in the conference finals. But now... But now when you have more pieces, when you have a better team, and I'm not even worried about your record because, you know, you guys finish, you know, top three right where you're supposed to. Ultimately, when you look at that, they all went into this season like, hey, we're going to try some different things defensively. We're going to try some different things offensively. We need to be able to be more versatile. And this is the comment that you make. This is the comment that you make going into this postseason run. That, I'm sorry, doesn't breed confidence. I don't need MJ. I don't need Kobe. I've played with silent masters, Jason Kidd, Steph Curry, Tim Duncan. I've played with guys that let their game do the talking. I don't need bravado, but I do need my, my leader, one of the great players in NBA history, to come up with a little bit more than like, hey, you know, we can lose to him again. Yes, everyone knows anybody can lose to anybody, but the confidence that you need to exude as a player with this type of talent, you haven't seen many statements like that from players of his caliber in NBA history, Max. In not everyone history, has to be built the same like way. That. Richard, not everyone has to be built the same way. A lot of it's the way it's delivered. A lot of it is like when you look at the guy, you sizing him up. Did I see someone who lacked confidence or seemed insecure or, or, or anything like that? No, it did. he did not come off that way to me. He was asked a question. He gave you a direct answer. And by oh. the way, the Bucs did improve the team. Not as much as the Sixers improved their team. Not as much as the Nets improved Nets. their team. That, you know, the Bucks to me, on paper, do not look like one of the two best teams in the conference. I just, I'm, being, I'm being honest. Well, 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 Max, first of all, can we stop acting like we're ready to handcuff him and throw him in jail? We're saying we disagree with the damn comments, okay? Let, let, let's, let's pump the brakes here. That's all we're saying. We're saying that we don't necessarily like those comments, and here's the reason why. We talked about Harden and, and KD and Kyrie and how prolific this offense is, even though they, you know, they only, they've only played eight games together. They would happen to be the number two offense in the NBA. Do you know who number one is? That would happen to be the Milwaukee Bucks with Giannis averaging 28 and 11, with Chris Middleton averaging 20 and shooting nearly 40% from three-point range, along with guy like D guys like DiVincenzo, Drew Holiday. P.J. Tucker is even shooting 39.4% from right. three-point range. When you look at the Milwaukee Bucks, now, Max, if he made this statement, even though we wouldn't like it, and you were about to go up against the Brooklyn Nets, I feel you. But when the statement is made about a first-round series against the team that bounced you out in five games, the last time we saw you, again, we ain't cuffing you and throwing you in prison. We're simply saying, yo, man, that ain't what we trying to hear. 
Not from yeah, a reigning two-time league MVP. To, that's all we're saying. To, he's not trying to tell us what we want to hear. That's not what he's there I, we doing. Know this. And, and, we and know this. We know this. And, and, and we ain't... And, we ain't trying to do nothing. We just say we yeah, don't like it. Did he sound insecure to you? Is that how he sounded to you? Did he sound scared? No, but it's not about it's not, it's not about him sounding insecure, Max. It's about the energy that he is putting out to his teammates, to the organization, to the fan base. It's not a matter of like whether Giannis had 50 against the Brooklyn Nets. We know this man can play. We know this man can ball. And look, the only reason, like when you say we don't need a Kobe or an MJ, we don't need him to be that. But we do want him to be great. We, he has established that he wants to be great. And I'm not saying, like, look, everybody makes statements. Everybody says stuff. Like, look, LeBron James called Steph Curry the MVP before they play against him. Was he setting up something or was he just kind of buttering him up so he wouldn't be as fired up? Who knows? There are tactical things that you can say vocally, whether it's to calm down something or to perk people look, up. Guys. At the end of the day, when a person has had this type of, like, this type of, like, three-year stretch, yeah. you got to show guys, here's some the problem, confidence. Richard. Here's the problem, Richard. Giannis is actually a big. Stephen A. identified that correctly when, to me, it looked like he's kind of a hybrid wing. But, no, he's really a big, actually. And in the history of the NBA, almost every time, a, a super great big needs another dude on his level if he's trying to win a Max, chip. Max, stay on point, bro. So, stay on this point. Is the, this is the point, Stephen that, A. That's, this that, is that, the that, point. The they point is it's not unacceptable get to lose him. in the first round they against Miami. They did not get him. Don't sound that, like that. They did not get him that guy. If you want to pretend Drew Holiday is that. Hold it. You make excuses for him all time already? Not Max. 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 Yeah. Is there any excuse? I got a simple question. Is there any excuse whatsoever for the Milwaukee Bucks to lose them to Miami Heat in the first round? Is there an excuse? Yeah. If Miami's better, Miami could make a run. Yeah. That's I got my look. Unless okay. you think Miami I, can't I make a run. Look, no, no, look, look. Anybody can be. Look, I'm with you, Steve. I'm, I'm with you, Stephen A. I, look, look. Anybody can beat anybody. I Conference get what champs. you're saying, Max. Yes, but they're the defending Eastern Conference champ, and they over or they exceeded expectations. At some point in time, we can start holding Giannis not only just the positive side, but the negative side. The That's same way we talk about, about James Harden, Kevin Durant, LeBron James. The same way we talk about the way we want them to be leaders. Thank you. Okay, hold on. Time time if we're going to talk point. about that, if that you was guys, James Harden, Stephen if that a, was you Kevin have... Durant, if that was Steph Curry, if that was LeBron oh, James, that's oh, the point. Excuse the me. With I'm, a I'm, problem with I'm listening problem. every day to Stephen Stephen A Ray, telling me Ray, that Ray, Chris Ray. Paul, Chris Paul deserves MVP Ooh. consideration. Chris Paul's an all-time great. He's one of the greatest point guards ever. Chris Paul never been past the second round. That's Chris Paul's playing the. Wait, wait, hold on. Time out. Time out. Time out. Chris we Paul's listen playing. to you. No, no, time out. Chris Paul's oh playing the defending God. Western Conference champions who are a low seed. If they do it, if he gets bumped out by the Lakers, is there an excuse? Uh, excuse me. He's six feet, can barely. Oh, touch now you're the gonna backboard. bring up height. Tough with your shorts. You're playing excuse basketball. Max, Max, I swear to God, Molly, I swear to God, I'm gonna ask you another how tall you are? I can't listen to you with your ignorant self talk back and forth. I can't believe that you would sit up there and try to hold the same level of responsibility to a six foot point guard compared to I a six eleven. Jack, Jack is seven you inches taller than Michael Jordan. Jordan. You, you hold Jordan to a higher standard. What are you talking about? You call, you've called him that. You said that he was the most dominant. Mm -hmm. I believe in Giannis. I believe in him, and I know he can play. I know he's elite. What I'm saying is, I'm not trying to question anything about Miami. They're legit, too. But if uh -huh. you're Giannis, you do not have an excuse to lose in the first round to the Miami Heat this year. You do I not see. have it. I see. But Chris you Paul has one it. to lose to, to the Lakers in the first round, right? Stop no. instigating, RJ. Does he or does he not? All right. <laughs> okay. All right. No, because he's six feet. All right. Okay, I, All right. I really, I really, I really am disgusted. Getting, he's an MVP, this is, this is getting but he can't lose. Him. But Giannis, Giannis, is, Giannis is, is different. I'm just so disgusted awkward. that I have to right. talk basketball with you. I should be paid extra for it. I really should. Hi, Molly. I really should. Have a good Take day. Easy, bye, Rich. bye Have everyone. A good day, Roll the bump. Let's go to commercial. The playoffs are about to be underway. Stephen A looking into his crystal ball. How do we see all these series shaking out? Let's go. Stay with us. Hi, guys.